Good morning. Welcome to Antioch Bible Church, second service, 11 o'clock. So very glad you're here. For those of you that are online with the live stream, or even with some of you who are going to be watching this a week from now or four or five days from now, we're so glad you're checking in. And again, we'll pray that by the time you're done, you say, there were divine appointments that went on. God, talk to me. Whether you're a non-Christian saying, what's this gospel about? Or a Christian who's saying, you know what, I want to learn and grow. Or maybe someone who says, I claim to be a Christian, but God knows because I'm sure not. A, no one else would know. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're checking in. Glad you're involved. Father, we bow before you. We thank you for the opportunity to still be able to meet freely, to be able to share a message as your word uh, spells out not being censored. Uh, Lord God, would you please make sure that whatever the motivation, someone came here, whether they're on their way here or going home, Spirit of God, would you be our teacher? We bow to you. We pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is raised high and pray that our time together would bring you honor. We pray through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and worship this morning. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring This morning, you might be on uh, the top of a mountain and everything's going great, or maybe you're in a bit of a valley this morning, but either way, we bless the name of the Lord because he is with us. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when i'm found in the desert place though i walk through the wilderness blessed be your name darkness 
your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Sit down and enjoy the video. Good morning, Antioch. As always, we've got lots of great things ahead, events to join in on, as well as opportunities to serve. We hope you'll join us next week in person or online as we celebrate 36 years of Antioch Bible Church. We honor the past, rejoice in the present, and excitedly look to the future, knowing that God leads us in every season. October is also Pastor Appreciation Month. What a great opportunity to express our gratitude for the leaders God has put in place at Antioch. Ladies, do you know about MOPS? We're a fun, supportive group for moms with children ranging from pregnancy through sixth grade. It's a place to make friendships and connect with others in the same stage of life. We begin meeting virtually Wednesday, October 7th, and in person on the 21st. So register today on our website at avchurch.org mops to get your welcome bag delivered to your door. It's Double Impact Month for Antioch Adoptions, which means that all of your financial gifts through the end of October will be matched. Go to antiochadoptions.org for more information. In this season, it's more important than ever to have clear communication with our church body. So if you've had any major changes these past six months, like a new phone number, email, or address, please email me, mwilliams at avchurch.org, and I'll be happy to update your profile in our church database. To be clear, this information is used solely for the purpose of in-house administration. Just a reminder, the first Sunday of the month is Benevolent Sunday. 100% of your gifts to the Benevolence Fund goes to help families in need in our church and local community. Antioch, have a great week. It's time for our, uh, our weekly offering, but I would like to share something real quick before we do. Snitch one of my minutes if I can. Uh, I found out that this is going to be Dave Irish's last uh, morning with us for some time. He's going to be involved as the worship minister at his own church. Uh, Dave has been a friend of this church for as long as I can remember. I mean, it's been decades. And uh, I wanted us to tell him thank you, and I still hope that sometime we can get him back as a special guest maybe some time. And, David, I want to say this, and I mean this 100% straight up. When you do your worship, at least for me, I look up instead of at you. And uh, I believe that's what a worship leader is about. And you are a worship leader, brother. Amen. So thank you very much. <laughs> is there anybody new with us? Very first time you've been here? I can't tell on live stream, of course, but you know if you are or not. But anybody else that's uh, with us here first time? What I want to say about on offering and even on live stream, uh, if you're there, uh, our concern is your heart. Our concern is your soul. Our concern is your salvation. We're going to give an account for that, says Hebrews 13, 17 one day. Uh, if you're visiting, if you're a guest, if this is not your home, keep your money. If you're away from home, support your home church. Uh, that, that's where you need to go where you're fed. So uh, we say two things. Guests don't pay. Uh, guests, we're just glad you're here. And second, you can't buy salvation anyway. There are just too many places where if I put money in, it resolves me of some kind of guilt. And I go, no, it doesn't. The blood of Christ does. Money doesn't. So keep your money. If this is your home, if this is your church, if this is where you're fed, whether it's in person or online, you pray and then you do with your giving as God would lead you and direct you. Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that every bit of offering that's given, whether it's benevolence to hand out, to help, whether it's for the work of the ministry here, we pray the Lord Jesus Christ would be lifted high. We pray this through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I need to say one more thing that I missed. Because it's Benevolent Sunday, and we're now putting offering in the box, the regular offering, we've put little uh, envelopes. If you're wanting to do something for benevolence, put it in the envelope. And then we'll know that that's to, to hand out to people needing help with the benevolence. That's not regular offering. God bless you. Here's a song that will prepare our hearts for um, um, communion.
Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, Redemption's Hill, where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. time for communion. Things are a little bit different, as you know, than a typical situation. We had something even atypical even <laughs> uh, in this situation. Pastor Al told me that when we bought the little cups with the wafers that he had understood, we bought 500 of them. So when we work out our 50 and 70, we thought we were still rolling well. And uh, what we still going to share something about what communion is about because A, you're here, and B, we have people stream the herb sent out the note saying if you can put together an element, if you want to take communion with us, you can. Our apology, I know we'll do a better job counting and make sure that doesn't happen again. I'm kind of embarrassed and I'm sorry, but that's what happened. So um, here's what the remarks I would make about, uh, about communion. Um, Herb already said uh, one of his services are with different churches, handle it differently, some once a week, some once a quarter, some couple times a year. We have communion once a month. We do it as a time of remembrance. Here's what I was thinking about in getting us ready for this. I was looking at uh, Matthew chapter 26. I was looking at Mark 14. I was looking at Luke looking at the pastor that Al likes to use. The, the pastor, I think, is in 1 Corinthians 11. But the three Gospels, what each of them says, uh, it says that Jesus told his disciples to prepare the place for Passover. An Orthodox Jew, Jesus was an Orthodox Jew, and his followers, or at least most of them were, would have understood that at Passover you're to commemorate or remember God's deliverance when they were coming out of Egypt. Most of you remember the story in Exodus chapter 12. There have been a number of plagues, nine of them so far. Pharaoh hardens his heart, doesn't listen. He tells Moses, 
oldest son, and every family person is going to die. And that includes the Jewish families, unless they follow a provision that God had made. What was the provision? Take an unblemished lamb for your sacrificial uh, meal that you're going to have celebrating Passover. When you kill that, you take the blood of that unblemished lamb and you put it around the door. When death comes through, any door that has the blood will be passed over. That oldest child will or son will live. If it's not there, there's going to be death, whether it was in a Jewish encampment of slaves or whether it was the Egyptians. When Jesus says, we're going to celebrate a Passover, but I want you to remember something different from me to me. Here's what Paul says in, in uh, chapter 11. What I received from the Lord, that which I deliver to you, the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Was he aware it was Passover? And was he aware the purpose of the Passover was to remember God's deliverance given through Moses, given through the unblemished lamb and the blood? Yeah, he knew that. But he changes the, the directive. You're not doing this in remembrance of Moses. You're doing this in remembrance of me. Why? John 1.29, remember when the Baptist says of Jesus, this is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. God is again providing deliverance, but instead of freeing slaves out of Egypt and saying, you tell your children about this because I don't want them to forget this, so you do this annually, now he's told believers, I'm leaving soon. He'd already told them in chapter 16 and 18 and 20 of Matthew that he's going to he's, he's gonna die. But why? came to die as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. When the blood was applied in Exodus 12, death passed. If it wasn't applied, even if they knew, Moses, I don't care, I'm going to eat the lamb, I'm not putting the blood around the door. That sounds silly to me. The heir dies. Remember, first son was the heir. When Jesus laid down his life as the Lamb of provides a provision for our alienation from God. And when the blood of that sacrifice is applied to our heart, death passes over. And we're given eternal life. Very much the same principle in both. It took a blameless lamb and the blood was the key to passing over death. The difference in the Old Testament, it was death for time. Jesus' death and sacrifice is for eternity. That is why in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul writes, Jesus Christ is our Passover sacrifice. And he goes on basically to say, so live as people not with leaven, but unleavened. In other words, your desire is to live pure lives. The lamb was sacrificed. Do this in remembrance of me. So the Passover became a precursor, a tutor, if you would, to lead us to the Last Supper. Our remembrance now is on the true Lamb of God who forgives sin. That's why we take, take communion. It's not the magic in the bread. It's not magic in, in the juice. It's the reminder God provided a provision through the death of Christ, blood sacrifice. Remember the book of Hebrews. The blood of animals can cover sin. It can't take it away. Our communion is a reminder. Our perfect lamb not only covered sin, he took it away. We're clean. We're free. So again, we take together. So what I would like you to do, at least those of you that prepared at home, we're not going to be able to do it here. When, uh, when Jesus presented himself and was sharing this, he told them, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. So if you're at home, 
it's time to take and eat and drink what? The body given. With the cup, he said, this is a new covenant in my blood. There was blood in the first covenant, but he says, this is a new. Remember, Christ said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. We have a perfect sacrifice whose blood is a remedy for the problem if we apply it. If we don't, we will die in our sin. sisters. God bless you. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King men and women and children said amen. 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 amen amen thank you dave well it is good to see everyone today how's everyone doing i have some uh dear friends in the house with me uh a lady who was my fifth grade teacher came today and uh a man who has been my barber for uh, probably, I don't know, at least probably 20 years, 25 years is here today. So that's one of the benefits of coming back home is that you've been knowing people for a minute. Uh, so, so it's so good. And it's so good to see uh, the Antioch family who I'm getting to know. Uh, thank you so much for joining on live stream. Uh, today we will be in our classic series, and the title of the message is Faith Works. The main passage that we'll be looking at today is James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And before I get into the message, I just want to have an opportunity to pray for you. I know that different people in the congregation are facing different circumstances in life that could be challenging. So it would really be a privilege if I could just pray for you uh, before we start the message today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for everyone who is here today. Lord, for everyone who is watching on live stream. And Lord, Father, I just want to pray for them with whatever they're facing in life. Lord, Father, I know this unique season of the coronavirus has brought about many challenges for everyone. Lord, I know that people are facing hardships uh, with family and 
possibly employment, Lord, with housing, sickness, and even death. And so, Father, I pray that you can come alongside uh, the youngest person here, even the youngest person watching, to the oldest person. And, Lord, just love them. Lord, just give them a great big hug and comfort them, Lord, and give them peace and guide them, Lord, during these most turbulent times. Lord, the Bible says that you are a God who cares for us. Lord, we thank you for caring for us. Lord, the Bible says you are a God who sees us. You are a God who hears us. Lord, when we pray, we are seen and we are heard by the creator of the universe. Lord, Father, so I just pray today for the congregation at Antioch Bible Church. I pray today for our guests, our visitors, or those who are just watching on live stream, that they will know how much you love them, that you, that you will bring them out of difficult times, Lord, that they can put their trust in you no matter what. So, Father, I just pray for everyone's specific situation. Lord, you know what it is. I don't. But you know. Father, be with them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I was blessed to have a wonderful father. My father raised my sister and me by himself. My mother died when I was four years old. She had a rare children's cancer. Her name was Dawn Hartzell. She died at the age of 29. My dad, he, he never remarried and did such a wonderful job just holding it down. And, and I'm so thankful for him today. And my, my father, he always had health challenges. And when I was in North Carolina, my sister sent me a text message, kind of an emergency text message. And so I got out of uh, a church meeting that I was in, and she had told me that dad died. And this was very difficult news. Uh, I'm his only son, and especially being away in North Carolina, I was there for seven years, so my dad and I weren't together very often. And so upon hearing this news, I left North Carolina and came to Seattle. And I went to a Mountain View funeral home in the Tacoma area. And I'm familiar with that funeral home because that's where my mother is buried. And my father would be buried beside my mom. And I made an appointment with the funeral home because I wanted to see my dad's body. I almost couldn't believe it that he passed away, so I wanted to see it with my own eyes. And so I went into the room, and there was a chair set up, and there was a bed, and he was lying on the bed. And, um, you know, he, he's dead, and but I'm still kind of talking to him and just reflecting and crying. Um, but when I was in that room, my, my dad wasn't there. His body was there, but my dad wasn't there. Um, the spirit of my dad is what made him my dad. Not the, not the casing or the body, but his spirit was the trademark of his life. And faith without works is like a dead body at a funeral home. The spirit is the life of the body. And in the same way, good works 
is the life of faith. The big idea of the message today is that genuine faith produces good works. Let's read James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. The Bible reads, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So in this passage today, to kind of give you a roadmap of where we're going, in verses 14 through 19, we'll discuss dead faith. And in verses 20 through 26, we'll discuss genuine faith. And in verses 20 through 26, when we look at the faith of Abraham and Rahab, we will look at uh, Genesis, and we will also look at the book of Joshua that shares these inspiring faith stories in detail. So in verse 14, James opens up with two questions that demand a negative answer. He says, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that faith save him? So the first question is, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? No good, right? There's no good in that. Can that faith save him? Probably not. You know, even in verse 14, you could almost put quotes quotation marks around faith. This person claims he has faith, but this is actually dead faith. A one-liner that I've heard that has helped me is this. We are not saved by good works, but to do good works. We are not saved by good works, but to do good works. When you are saved, you are connected to Jesus Christ. 
And as a result of being connected to the vine, we will bear fruit. And James has already laid this out for us in chapter 1 through chapter 2. James says that we will bear the fruit of counting it all joy when we face trials. James says that we will bear the fruit of being able to battle temptation. James says that we will bear fruit of not merely being hearers of the word, but by being doers of the word. James says we will bear the fruit of removing the sickness of partiality from our lives. And that then it's in this context that he says faith without works is dead. And James gives us a simple illustration in verse 15. He says if a brother or a sister is lacking the daily necessities of life, such as clothing and food, and one of you gives them a few religious words, God bless. A few pious words, he says, what good is that? As we saw in James chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. We must be merciful because we have received mercy from God. And we want to have mercy when we are judged by God as Christians. Now, James is not teaching that we should help disingenuous people who take advantage of good-hearted Christians. But if we have resources to meet a genuine need, why would we not meet that need? Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are in the household of faith. And in verse 18, James starts getting a little sarcastic with his audience. He is writing to Jewish Christians, but he is trying to drive home a point. So he says this. He says, show me your faith apart from your works. Well, that's impossible. <laughs> How can you show me your faith apart from works? There's nothing to show. So he employs sarcasm and he says, I will show you my faith by my works. I don't have to tell you that I'm a Christian. You will know that I'm a Christian by the way that I live my life. In verse 19, again, sarcasm. You believe that God is one. You do well. You're not doing well. <laughs> James is being sarcastic here. He said, you believe that God is one. Even the demons believe that God is one. You are not doing well at all. Believing that God is one does not mean that you have faith in Christ. Demons believe that God exists, and they tremble at his presence. We see this in the scriptures. Faith is not an intellectual endeavor, and it's also not an emotional response. David Platt says this, and I quote, In easy believism is rampant today, in contemporary Christianity, where all kinds of people are claiming and believing they are right before God the Father. But they have absolutely no interest in walking with God as friend. And James says such people don't have faith. Their faith is dead. So as we see in verses 14 through 19, dead faith 
has no works. But genuine faith produces good works. So now we will be inspired by two heroes of the faith, Abraham and Rahab. But before we look at these heroes, it's necessary to understand what James means when he writes, justified by works. As we see in verse 21, it says, Abraham, our father, was justified by works. And then in verse 24, it says, you see that a person is justified by works. And then in verse 25, it says that Rahab the prostitute was justified by works. So this passage in James seems to, at first glance, contradict the Apostle Paul when he says we are justified by faith, not by works. Giving you a little background, James and Paul were partners in the gospel. James was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James was the one who gave Paul the right hand of fellowship and said, go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. They were partners in the gospel. You see this in Acts chapter 15, also in Acts chapter 21. You will see Paul and James interacting. So let's take a look at these two verses side by side so we can understand what James is writing when he says justified by works. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Paul says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. James chapter 2, verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So which one is it? Justified by faith or justified by works? My argument is that it's both. The word justified can mean to declare righteous, and it can also mean to demonstrate righteousness. Righteousness can refer to how we stand before God in salvation. Righteousness can also refer to how we live before God in sanctification. Here is a chart to compare the apostles. Paul is writing to non-Christians about salvation. James is writing to Christians about sanctification, being set apart, growing in your faith. Paul is emphasizing how to become a Christian. James is emphasizing how to live as a Christian. So James chapter 2 only applies to Christians because James was writing to Christians. So after that, as a pastor, I feel the obligation to answer the question, so what? So how does that affect me? <laughs> what impact does that have on me? Well, let me tell you what I learned. I always thought that justification had to do with salvation. Because I love the book of Romans, and that's what Paul is writing about, justification by faith. So when you come over to James and you see this, justification by works, 
to be fully transparent, it is confusing. To me, and it's probably confusing to you. But now that I know justified can mean salvation, or it can also mean sanctification, that's very helpful to me. But a non-Christian must come to God and be justified by faith alone. You can't work your way to heaven. But when you are a Christian, you can apply James chapter 2 to your life. And you can say, I've already been declared righteous before God. Therefore, I am demonstrating my righteousness and I am living out my faith in sanctification. So that's what I learned. So hopefully that will clear a few things up for you. I'm thankful for that justification on March 7th, the year of 2000, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for that. And now I know that I am this ongoing project. I am under construction. I am being sanctified. And I pray that I'm justified by my works, that I demonstrate my righteousness to a world who needs to see Christ. Abraham and Rahab were Christians who were justified by works. They demonstrated their righteousness by living out their faith. Abraham was a patriarch of the faith. He was a Jew with high status. And then you have a stark contrast with Rahab, who was a prostitute, a Gentile, a woman with low status. But the stark contrast of two opposites reminds us, James chapter 2, verse 1, that God shows no partiality. God is no respecter of persons. Father Abraham made the Faith Hall of Fame. Hebrews chapter 11. Rahab the prostitute also made the Faith Hall of Fame. So when we look at Abraham in verses 21 through 23, it says this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Let's turn our Bibles to the very first book in, in the Bible, which is Genesis. Genesis chapter 22. Or if you have a phone, you can click on the Bible app, Genesis 22. And this story is so inspiring, Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him, faith. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes 
and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. Faith. And Abraham took the, word, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son, faith. So they both went together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes. And looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Wow. How would you handle yourself during that circumstance? This is an amazing account of faith. Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 is the account of Abraham's salvation. Abraham was promised offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he was promised a son. He was 100 years old, and his wife Sarah was 90 years old. But God promised Abraham a son and a great amount of descendants. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 says, And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. As you study the timeline of Genesis from Genesis chapter 15 to Genesis chapter 22, it's reasonable to believe that 30 years had passed. God used those 30 years to mature Abraham in his faith. And God was righteous in testing Abraham because he knew that his son Isaac would not be harmed. And Abraham told his son, God will provide the lamb. And God did provide. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19 sheds light on Abraham's faith. This is a mature faith. He had been saved for possibly 30 years, and this is how he felt. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, <laughs> from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. He said, my faith is so strong, even if I do have to slaughter my son, that he'll be resurrected in front of my eyes. Wow. 
this man had strong faith. And now we will turn our attention to Rahab, a prostitute, a Gentile, a woman, someone who is despised in society. James says that she was also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to the right to the book of Joshua, chapter 2. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, chapter 2. And we will be challenged by Rahab who risk her life for the faith that she has in God. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. Here is Rahab's faith account. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. Verse 4, but the woman, Rahab, had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. Faith. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them, up, brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Here's her faith. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, Please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. And give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brother and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Rahab risked her life by lying to the king. This is royal treason. But she protected these Israelite spies. And she made a pact with the spies that her family would be protected. And you know the story when Israel came in there, they marched around that wall, and on the seventh day, the trumpet sounded, and those walls came tumbling down. There was only one family that was spared, the family of Rahab. 
Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, Rahab is in the faith hall of fame. This is what it says. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And by the grace of God, Rahab married an Israelite. According to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Rahab became the great, great grandmother of King David. God strategically placed a Gentile prostitute in the lineage of Jesus Christ. He truly shows no partiality. Church, we must stay connected to the vine if we are going to bear fruit. As you abide in Christ, you will naturally and organically produce good works. You will help the brother or sister in Christ who is lacking in daily necessities. You will share the gospel with those who merely believe that a God exists. You will be willing to sacrifice what is most valuable to you, like Abraham, and put your life in God's hands, like Rahab. As a closing question, I want to ask you, what helps you stay connected to the vine? What is it that activates your faith to produce good works and to bear your fruit to demonstrate the righteousness of Jesus Christ? I have learned that it's different for all people. Not everyone is read your word and pray. Some people, worship music really connects them to God. For some people, serving others connects them to the vine. For some people, it's evangelism that does it. What is it that really connects you to God? What is it that after doing that activity, you are activated in your faith and you are ready to bear fruit? Personally, for me, It's time alone with God. I like to use Jesus' method and get away from everything and just spend time in prayer, spend time in solitude, have my Bible, have my journal, have a pen with no distractions. And if it were my choice, I'd spend an hour, two hours, maybe three hours or a whole day with God. But what is it for you that keeps you connected to the vine? Because genuine faith produces good works. Our faith should be active. Our works will complete our faith. So I want to challenge you to carve out time in your schedule to do that activity that helps you stay connected to Jesus. Protect that time. I know life is busy, but you have to protect that time because there's no other time that is more valuable than staying connected to Jesus Christ. As you abide in him, you will naturally produce good works. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so gracious. Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, you are so good to us and you give us this inspiring teaching. Lord, that some have taken as a theological puzzle. But Lord, Father, you show us what it means in your word to be justified by faith and to be justified by works. And then we see Lord, these heroes of the faith, Lord, Abraham and Rahab, who inspire us. Lord, Father, help us to be justified by our works. 
Help us to demonstrate the righteousness of the salvation that you have given us. If anyone is here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says today is the day for salvation. If you're a non-believer, you merely believe that a God exists. Today is the day where you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You will not be able to work your way into heaven. And as an unbeliever, even the good works that you do, God is not pleased with them because they do not glorify him. You must come to Jesus Christ by faith. And for the believers in Jesus Christ, who have already experienced salvation. James speaks to us that faith without works is dead, that our faith must be active and completed by our works. Oh, Lord, Father, help us to bear fruit. Lord, help us to demonstrate the righteousness of Christ to a hurting world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. So thankful for his word. And yeah, if you made that decision today, that first time decision to come to Christ by faith and salvation, I want you to uh, go to our website. And on the home page, you'll see a button that says salvation. And right there, just click and it will populate an email that will be sent to the pastors. And we want to help you grow in your faith. And for everyone else, I hope you were sincerely encouraged uh, by the word of God today. And that when you leave here, you won't leave here the same. We never want to come in here to do some type of uh, religious practice. We want to come in here to be transformed. Not being hearers of the word, but being doers of the word. That when we walk out, our neighborhoods our employment, everyone will know, man, something's different. This person is growing in the faith. This person is making a difference. And I know you'll do that. God's word never returns void. Thank you guys for being here today. And I'm going to be uh, down here. And I'm more than happy to uh, greet anyone who wants to come talk with me. Uh, there's little footprints right there for social distancing. Um, many of you may know that I have a son who's 14 years old that is, has special needs and he's very compromised in his respiratory system. So if he got COVID, it would be a wrap. And so I just ask that he's six feet of social distancing. That's all I ask. And thank you for respecting that I have to be uh, very careful during this time. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. Thank you.